and welcome to the 1913 Lockout Podcast Series. I'm your host, Moira Murphy. On this week's show, we look at the development of new unionism and focus on a number of events which took place outside the city of Dublin during the era of the Lockout. John Cunningham, lecturer in Irish Labour History at NUIG, discusses the labour disputes which occurred in Galway and Sligo at that time, and we'll also be looking at the Belfast Dockers' Strike. We'll feature Mother Jones, a prominent labour and community organiser originally from Cork, but active with the industrial workers of the world in the United States. By the end of the 19th century, a new form of union organisation emerged to meet the needs of the marginalised and poorest sections of the working class, namely the unskilled. These unions, emerging from Britain, existed alongside the previously dominant craft unions, and unlike these more conservative unions, they offered low subscription rates and gave priority to winning improvements in wages and conditions, rather than simply providing friendly benefits. This new unionism generated a militancy which challenged the existing conceptions of labour organisation. Instead of the craft union device of maintaining scarcity of labour through the control of apprenticeships, the new unions aimed to defend its members' living standards through strike action. But along with this, there came an emphasis on the development of a new political consciousness characterised by a belief that labour interests must go beyond purely industrial matters to campaigns for legislative reform and political representation. Perhaps the most significant example was the demand for the eight-hour working day, won internationally. Ireland's economic structure presented specific challenges for the development of new unionism here, and its success would depend on two external factors, the trade cycle and British support. Unlike Britain, and with the exception of the North East, there was very little manufacturing on the island, which led to heavy reliance on commerce. Above all else, it was to be the Transport and General Alliance, which was to guarantee trade union success in Ireland and disputes in transport had an extensive impact. From 1889 to 1913, transport constituted a leading sector in the evolution of Irish trade unionism. The other elements being essential services, the Belfast shipyards, textiles and agriculture. Historian John Cunningham talks to us about some of the lesser known labour disputes which took place around the country in the early 1900s. It's been said, indeed, that um, the dispute in Dublin, essentially, was part of a general upsurge of labour militancy on uh, these islands and, indeed, further afield in the the same uh, years. The events in Dublin, uh, I suppose, the most dramatic and, uh, indeed, uh, events of uh, the most dramatic dispute, hardest-fought dispute of uh, that period, on a large scale, certainly. But similar type of things happened in other places. Uh, The Wexford dispute is epic in its own way, uh, comparable uh, to Dublin. Uh, Sligo dispute, arguably, of 1913 is also epic. didn't involve as many many people, but they uh, occurred in smaller places. Uh, If we take um, uh, events in Galway and Sligo, for example, uh, you have a um, comparison, say, with uh, Dublin in the way uh, you have the emergence of these strong men employers, colourful figures, um, uh, Martin Moore McDonough in Galway, for example, largest employer. Uh, he's been referred to as Mr. Galway. He was chairman of everything, uh, religious, charitable, sporting, cultural. He was uh, chairman without perhaps many interests being particularly interested in some of these endeavours, but uh, he was in charge. He led the Galway employers, again, um, refusing um, uh, or or being reluctant to recognise the rights of his casual workers to represent themselves. Taken by surprise in the uh, first uh, instance, um, the workers were uh, Galway workers who established uh, a local union in uh, August 1911, were able to win some, uh, uh, some minor successes uh, before they faced a lockout, I think, in late March of uh, 1912. Uh, the lockout was short. Uh, Martin Moore was fo- forced to give some concessions, uh, but he came back uh, the following year uh, and essentially behaved in a provocative way which forced people into a strike 
in conditions which suited him. It was a strike that, like Dublin, was marked by the introduction of blackleg labour uh, from Liverpool, who couldn't obviously uh, be um, housed in the town itself, so they had to be kept on board ship in the, in the bay uh, while they offloaded uh, strike-bound vessels and so on. I should mention uh, the existence of a novel by Liam O'Flaherty, a uh, well-known writer, which has been republished recently. Uh, it's called The House of Gold. Essentially, Galway's Strumpet City, or the West of Ireland's Strumpet City. But it's uh, the uh, anti-hero there, Raymond Moore Costello, is based very much on uh, Martin uh, Moore McDonough. To talk about Sligo, I suppose, the ITGWU uh, gets a toehold in Sligo from late uh, 1911, and they succeed in a dispute in uh, June 1912 in winning considerable uh, concessions from, uh, from, from, the, from the employers. Uh, now, the employer of Sly in Sligo is a man called uh, the major employer, this sort of Mr. Big, if we want to call him that, of Sligo, is a man called Arthur Jackson. He's um, chairman of the Sligo Steamship Navigation Company. He's the uh, managing director of Pollock Spins, who are a major uh, employer in the area as well. Undisputed, he's a Belfast Presbyterian who marries into the merchant Pollock Spin family. Um, Jack B. Yates and, um, uh, and his brothers and sisters, indeed, called him Uncle Arthur because he was their Uncle Arthur. And uh, Jackson, as leader of the employers, was forced to give some concessions in 1912 uh, significantly more concessions that he would have liked. In fact, he basically had to recognise uh, uh, a closed shop or to accept a closed shop on the port, uh, which prevented uh, um, any type of victimisation of the trade union leaders and so on. But he wasn't happy about uh, the uh, situation. And just as, Mar uh, as William Martin Murphy did in Dublin, he set about arranging matters where he could claim back the concessions which he had given in June uh, 1912. He made uh, co um, um, contact with the authorities, obviously. He made arrangements with local uh, brokers, stevedoring families and so on, uh, uh, so that he could secure some local uh, scab labour. He also made contact with the Shipping Federation, which was an international union-busting organisation, uh, to arrange um, uh, for the supply of, uh, of, 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 of scab labour to Sligo uh, when it was necessary. Um, then, uh, everything in place, all the ducks in a row, as we might say, um, he proceeded to behave provocatively, sacking unionised seamen, replacing them with non-union labour, um, uh, uh, and uh, over a, the period of March, provoking the ITGWU into defending uh, people that were dismissed and into uh, going on a strike, not perhaps at a moment of their choosing. Um, interestingly, it was the union that showed, uh, I suppose, um, uh, some uh, tendency to compromise uh, during this period, but they were in a position where they wanted to be. They were, uh, had achieved a closed shop. So this, thus in uh, through between about the 8th and the 19th of March, you have a, um, a development of the situation, uh, which results in a dispute which, again, like Wexford, is on a scale equivalent to the Dublin strike and involving precisely the same sector of the population, the poorest third of the population, uh, the dockers, the yard workers, the milled workers, the casual workers generally, and of course affecting their families indeed. The world today is mourning, the death of Mother Jones. Grief and sorrow hover over the miners' homes. This grand old champion of labour has gone to a better land. With the hard-working miners, they miss her guiding hand. That hand had guided workers through struggles across the United States for the best part of 30 years. On a cold December morning in 1930, thousands gathered in the small mining town of Mount Olive, Illinois, to mourn the death of Mother Jones. 
The journey that ended that day began with the birth of Mary Harris in Cork in 1837. As a child, she was to see a country devastated by the potato blight and bore witness to how its impacts were defined by social and economic inequality. A landlord class evicted and intimidated tenants, while a government stymied by ideology and bigotry failed miserably to alleviate the great hunger. She escaped the clutches of despair with her family as they emigrated to Canada, and after qualifying as a teacher in Toronto, Mary moved briefly to Michigan before marrying George Jones, an iron molder, and started a family with him in Memphis, Tennessee. Two tragic events were to define her life. In 1867, her husband and her four children died in a yellow fever epidemic, and she subsequently returned to Chicago, where she established a small dressmaking business. Yet misfortune was to follow her there, and her shop was destroyed in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. Little is known of her life from then until the 1890s when she emerged in the labour movement. How and why she came to style herself as Mother Jones is unclear. However, it is not hard to consider the move was heavily influenced by the limited options open to her. Victorian working class women were expected to remain subservient to the men of their lives while working when necessary in low paying and physically strenuous jobs that were usually for paid extensions of domestic labour. Being an organiser for the labour unions offered both meaningful work and the possibility of tangible results. Her life as Mother Jones began at a time of national economic upheaval, with the economy of the USA rapidly industrialising. Hand in hand with growth of factories like Tansha Railroads, with the accumulation of capital and the rise of banks, and anti-labour legislation. But instead of wishing to return to the frugality of self-sufficiency and a nostalgically remembered past, Mother Jones wanted to move forward to the future of social justice and a decent life for all people. She became famous for her ability as a fiery orator. While she was most closely associated with bitter conflicts between employers and workers in Colorado and West Virginia, she travelled extensively and participated in strikes and worker conflicts wherever she went, with newspapers regularly judging the severity of conflict by whether Mother Jones was present or not. She was famously described as the most dangerous woman in the country today in 1902 by a West Virginian state attorney when she broke an injunction against her speaking at meetings in the state. Perhaps the most difficult thing in considering the life of Mother Jones was trying to assign a particular ideology to her. She was critical of the Socialist Party of the United States, describing them as removed from the screams and groans and heartaches of women and children by their own doctrinal squabbles and having witnessed the influence of anarchist ideas in Chicago during the upheaval of the 1880s. She feared their approach brought too much pain and suffering to working classes, and while she was present at the foundation of the Industrial Workers of the World in 1905, and realised the need for one big union and class unity, she remained peripheral to its activities, failing to mention links to it in any of her subsequent writings. In essence, she was staunch unionist, and saw revolutionary change as essential to the dawning of a new age. Her approach had seen it labelled as closer to the heart than the brain of the labour movement. But perhaps she put it best herself when she said, I belong to a class who have been robbed, exploited and plundered down through many long centuries, and because I belong to that class, I have an instinct to go and help them Jane. Mother Jones had asked to be buried in Mount Olive alongside miners who had died in the 1898 Battle of Verdi, who near her boys when the end came. She was denounced as the grandmother of all agitators during her lifetime, but this was a mantle she wore proudly and crafted carefully. In autumn 1936, a monument to Mother Jones was unveiled in that minor cemetery of Mount Olive. Speaking that day, Mrs Burgess, a former District 12 official, described how in her final years, Mother Jones only expressed wish was to live for another hundred years. The fight to the end that there would be no more machine guns and no more sobbing little children. Now, as you might expect in uh, circumstances uh, like those in Sligo, where people are being deprived of their daily bread, essentially, where you have the introduction of hundreds of police into the town, where you have the introduction of up to 150 uh, strike breakers from Britain, uh, and they're housed on, um, the, in sheds, in storage facilities in the docks. You can imagine 
Uh, excitement is at a fever pitch. It's in this context that some uh, local uh, scabs, in fact, kill one of the, um, one of the uh, strikers, a fellow called uh, Patrick Dunbar. They weren't convicted of murder because the, uh, um, the uh, uh, justice system accepted that they'd act in, acted in self, their plea of self-defence, essentially. But um, you have a, a situation um, uh, of considerable tension, uh, certainly with the arming of scabs and so on, just as you would see in uh, Dublin uh, later on. But um, workers, despite uh, all of this, uh, the, st the striking ITGWU uh, branch uh, uh, held out uh, um, until uh, they uh, secured uh, victory. There were efforts on the part of local authority and the parts of the state via the Board of Trade, and Trade on the part of the bishop to settle it. Then suddenly and mysteriously, one day, eight weeks after the strike started, uh, a settlement was announced, which was a total uh, uh, con uh, concession on the part of Arthur Jackson. There's folklore in Sligo, which explains it in terms of his desire to, um, to, to keep a, a secret, a personal, a dark personal secret from getting into the public uh, domain. But I think the real uh, s story, essentially, was the... Uh, stubbornness uh, and the, the sort of determination, essentially, of the um, I, I, of the ITGWU in Sligo. Larkin regarded it as the most complete victory won by the union uh, in its history up until that point, in terms of the degree of control it gave the union over. Uh, the hiring, firing, and uh, um, I suppose the reward for labour in any Irish port town. Jim Larkin arrived in Belfast on January 20th, 1907, as a National Union of Dock Labourers delegate to the British Labour Party Conference. At the time, Edwardian Belfast was the fastest growing city in the British Isles, boasting the world's largest shipyard, linen mill, rope works, and tobacco factory. While skilled labour had benefited from the economic boom and improved wages and conditions, the vast majority of the working class were unskilled and lived in conditions not much better than those in the mid-19th century. It was this group that Larkin sought to organise. Previous attempts to do this had failed in large part due to the sectarian divisions in the city. This was notably the case with the dock workers, where Larkin organised first. There was a clear demarcation between Protestant cross-channel dockers and Catholic deep sea ones. But Larkin, promising a union that fought for improvements rather than negotiating surrender, organised 2,000 of the 3,000 dockers into the union by April. Emboldened by the spirit of militancy in the workplace, dockers in the Belfast Steamship Company walked out in early May, rather than work with a non-union man. Larkin viewed this as a mistake and sent them back to work, but the company refused to take them, bringing in scabs to fill their positions. In this way, the Belfast dock strike began. Thomas Gallagher, who owned the Belfast Steamship Company, was a foe much like Larkin and the Dublin workers would face six years later in William Martin Murphy. Owner of a business empire built on tobacco fortune, he was feted by the media as the spirit of Belfast boom and refused to enter talks with union officials. In response to being stonewalled, Larkin sought to escalate and expand the strike, first targeting Gallagher's businesses and then the supply lines for the docks. He organised a successful petition by the city's coal importers before moving to a general strike of all shipping companies. He hoped that this would isolate Gallagher and cut his supply lines of scab labour. Seven smaller companies yielded and gave improved conditions and better wages, but without the necessary support from Britain, larger ones held out. Following this failure, under pressure from moderates in his own movement to negotiate, and with the capitalist press trying to foster sectarian division, Larkin briefly stepped back from leading the strike and nominated independent Orangeman Alex Boyd in his place. However, within days the moderate strategy was in ruins, as Gallagher rebuffed the Lord Mayor's attempt to moderate. This escalated the dispute again, with Larkin turning to the city's carters next. They went out on strike, cutting supplies to the docks and rendering scab labour, keeping them running useless. The strike now had widespread support among the city's working class. The Catholic Larkin received a standing ovation in Protestant Sandy Row, and Orangeman Alex Boyd's speech was similarly well received in the Nationalist Falls Road. On July 26th, a massive march in support of the strike passed through both Catholic and Protestant areas. The city's working class was united in a way it rarely had been before or had been since.
This, however, was to mark a high point for the strike. A failure of the British trade union movement to offer funding or support and the introduction of the military to take the streets back from the workers led to its collapse. In total, 6,000 troops were brought in to restore law and order after the RIC itself had mutinied demanding better conditions and pay. Nationalist politicians from the Dungannon clubs, precursors of Sinn Féin, sought to turn the narrative from the strike to opposition to British militarism. After a riot in the Lower Falls saw three Catholics shot dead, the already brittle coalition that sustained the strike was irreparably broken. By August 17th, with little leverage left, the strikers grudgingly accepted terms available weeks earlier. The battle had ended in defeat. The Belfast Dock Strike did, however, leave a legacy. It proved, however briefly, that sectarianism could be transcended in the sea. And by its syndicalist tactics, inspired a wave of strikes all over Ireland that was to culminate in the 1913 rocket. Unfortunately for Belfast, the defeat of the strike broke organised labour and left little resistance to the employing class, who increasingly wielded the sectarian card to combat class consciousness. It was largely left behind as the wave of radicalism gripped Ireland in the next decade. But as the mural opened recently in Sailor Town evidences, the strike lingers in the city's consciousness. It reads, Belfast, Dock and Carter strike. Not as Catholics or Protestants, not as nationalists or unionists, but as Belfast workers standing together. What we're hoping to emphasize in this episode is that the 1913 lockout was not a random, semi-mythical phenomenon and that it was not isolated to Dublin. It was part of a wave of worker militancy across the Western world. It arose out of the need of working class people to come together and organise for better working and living conditions. This is the narrative that connects the IWW and Mother Jones in America to the Clyde in Scotland, to Liverpool, to Ireland, in Cork and Belfast, Wexford, Galway, Sligo and Dublin. The period of the lockout is part of the common story of the entire working class. This new unionism, as it was called, took the forms it did out of expediency, mass direct action by casual workers who had not been organised by other means and not organisations. The established working class organisations had ossified and were not able to combat bosses effectively. New unionism filled the space they left behind. In a combination of ad hoc and wildcat actions, solidarity across sectors and sympathetic industrial action, workers found the means to fight and win, and in, in the process, improve their lives. What is the relevance of this for us today in 2013? While there are big differences between today and a century ago, there are also striking similarities. The militancy of the day regenerated the labour movement. The battles for a shorter working week, better wages and conditions for all were ingrained in the movement, as was the idea of a general union that involved workers in different sectors, unlike the old craft unions that kept workers divided. Today, trade union membership is falling after a concerted 30-year effort by employers to undermine the position of workers. The question is, can unions successfully reinvent themselves to meet the challenges of today, like they did in the era of new unionism? There are some positive signs that are reminiscent of a new unionism for the 21st century that could signal another blossoming of working class organisation and militancy. Unorganised workers, precarious and otherwise, are taking direct action against their employers for better conditions and pay. Against the odds, somewhat casual workers in unsecure employment, like in McDonald's, Starbucks and Walmart, and elsewhere around the world, are showing innovation and leadership. This new wave is showing signs of spreading to Ireland too. There are inspiring cases like the game, HMV, Licenza, Thomas Cook and Vita Cortex workers responding instinctively to attacks from employers by occupying their workplaces. The erosion of rights, increasing scarcity of secure full-time employment and the reduction in unemployment benefit, as well as the rise in education costs, among many other things, have contributed to a new situation which many working class people face, that of precarity which, in terms of organisation, presents many difficulties not unlike those facing the unskilled of a hundred years ago. We'll investigate this and look at how workers might organise successfully today in our final podcast in this series. That's all for this week. If you would like to contribute or get in touch, email us at ub1913 at gmail.com or visit our website ub1913.wordpress.com Contributors for this week's show were Shane Fitzgerald, Owen Griffin, Fiona Duncan, Jen O'Leary and Ronan Burtonshaw. Thanks to John Cunningham. 
Produced by Tom McDermott and Moira Murphy. <laughs>